<laughs> yes, yeah, so my name is Jeffrey West, and uh, I've uh, spent most of my career uh, working in uh, fundamental physics, high energy physics, quarks and gluons, and uh, dark matter, and uh, string theory, and Higgs particles, and all the rest of the stuff. Uh, and um, I was trained as a physicist, and I, as I say, spent most of my career doing uh, conventional basic science. And uh, beginning in the 90s, uh, gradually um, and sort of unconsciously, really, I began to broaden my interest. I'd always had very broad interests. I mean, uh, 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 but... Uh, Professionally, I kept them relatively narrow. But in the 90s, I started to professionally broaden out because I became uh, uh, very interested in some uh, fundamental questions in biology. And uh, that led me on a path into, for want of a better word, complexity science and uh, joining the Santa Fe Institute, which is sort of the world hub of <laughs> complexity science. And um, so since the, uh, the mid-90s, my interests um, have shifted uh, towards these um, um, more, um, how should I say it, uh, global problems. I mean, ones that are uh, to do with things that happen on this earth. Uh, that is, life, um, social interaction, uh, the questions of adaptation and evolution, and the questions now of sustainability. So that has occupied me for the last, uh, say, 20-odd uh, years. And I joined the Santa Fe Institute um, in uh, the, uh, or about 2003, 2004, even though I've been part of the community for 10 years, previous 10 years. And, um, and as I say, gradually and unconsciously, I sort of changed careers. Uh, although I uh, definitely consider myself a physicist, despite the fact that I work in biological and biomedical problems, and social problems and so forth. But I come to it kind of shamelessly from a traditional physicist viewpoint, meaning that I'm uh, very much uh, guided by the idea that the kind of science uh, that I'm interested in and the kind of science that excites me is the kind of science that can be put in a principled framework, that can be mathematizable or at least computational and can be predictive and testable. So um, it's not that I don't like to speculate on other things, I certainly do, but um, I, I, I think somehow part of my quest, even though it's not very explicit, is how far can you push the boundaries of a highly rational, mathematizable science? You know, does it go, or, you know, the, sort of the paradigm of physics, how far can you actually take that into all these other fields, um, you know, because it's remarkable because one of the great achievements of the 20th century was uh, to erect a credible story for the, so to speak, the origins and history and evolution of the universe on the grand scale, from the Big Bang onwards. And that's extraordinary. And I would say, that if you'd ask that kind of question, whether that was conceivable 50 years ago, most people would have poo-pooed it. Other than we've, you know, we've invented concepts of Big Bang and so on. But in terms of the kind of detail that we now are able to address, it's extraordinary. And that was very exciting. I don't work in that stuff anymore. Um, but, the, but what I do work in is taking that kind of framework, that kind of philosophical framework, um, and ask how far can you take it into these other questions um, in, 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 uh, that are all associated with life and all associated, for want of a better phrase, the messy world that's around us. So it's, it's going from 
this grand, big, universal picture of the cosmos to something that's incredibly parochial. Namely, I'm now really only interested in what happens on this planet, <laughs> which is, in fact, what I began to realize is maybe the most interesting part of the entire universe. Yeah. Sort of amazing. I mean, of course, there's life elsewhere and so on. But, you know, God knows if we'll ever even have any contact or any inkling. So meanwhile, what could be more interesting than, than all this crap around us? I mean, it's unbelievable, right? Who could believe that the universe could uh, do this kind of stuff? I mean, it's so... It's, I mean, in a way, it's so clockwork and uninteresting on the level of even what we're doing here, you know, just having this, beginning this conversation, or that, you know, we're having to deal with Mr. Trump, or, uh, you know, that uh, we He's hardly worry clockwork. about... Yeah, exactly. That's my point. He's not <laughs> clockwork. And so, yeah. Anyway, I'm being sort of uh, cartoonish in this, but... But that's so that's been my trajectory. I've gone from, you know, really um, cosmological thinking, if you like, but fundamental particles, big picture, uh, to, um, you know, what's uh, the, the questions, the deep questions of, uh, the, that one has to address in terms of life, life in its most general sense, including social life, of course, the life that human beings have evolved in the last uh, 10,000 years. So under this, uh, complexity science is a, is one term that seems to capture a lot of what you've described, um, yeah. which is quite incredible given, <laughs> given the breadth of it, given the, given the range of things you've, you've just uh, spoken about. How would you uh, describe what complexity science is? And how did it come to be? Well, I think it's, you know, it's one of those things that I don't think anyone has a definition of complexity science. It's one of these phrases, words that are um, difficult to define. Um, and I usually think about when I'm talking about it, you know, giving lectures and so on, I usually do it um, in, in contrast to its it's opposite, namely simplicity, to say, you know, first of all, define what simplicity is. And simplicity is really what physics works on, namely um, uh, systems where we can uh, write down in a, an extraordinarily parsimonious, succinct way, um, you know, one or two equations that encompass you know, sort of everything. I mean, it's hard to believe that you can write down Newton's laws of motion, F equals MA, Newton's law of gravitation, that the force goes inversely with the square and proportional to the masses. And from that, in a certain sense, all motion <laughs> is, is encapsulated. You know, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. And uh, that's simplicity. In other words, the idea that you can... Um, sort of have an, a, a, a parsimonious algorithm, if you like, that um, sums up and incorporates um, multiple phenomena which might seem unrelated but are encapsulated in these very simple equations. I mean, Maxwell's equations of electricity and magnetism or the fundamental equations of quantum mechanics, all these, you know, uh, roughly when, when you put them all together, um, describe much of the physical world around us. You know, to actually carry out calculations may be very complicated. Um, and uh, so that is distinguished from complexity, which is, for example, um, you know, how the human brain works or how does a cell work, where it's inconceivable that uh, one could write down sort of one or two equations and from that understand you know, the, what a cell is and uh, how it grows and how it uh, divides and so forth, or, um, you know, how a city works. There isn't one or two simple equations. Um, and that's because uh, these, first of all, contain an enormous number of individual components or agents or constituents 
um, uh, interacting with each other, and uh, they interact in a highly nonlinear way usually, and uh, they become adaptive. So the new thing that is really crucial beyond the simplicity of traditional physical systems, like you know the way uh, the, the solar system works, or the way even your iPhone works. Uh, the new thing is um, in, in these complex systems is that they are adaptive. They react to whatever changes in their external environment. And so, um, uh, you know, both uh, an organism, everything from an organism to a city, a company, even the weather, um, all these things are extremely dependent, typically, uh, from uh, moment to moment on what's happening external to them. Whereas, you know, the um, uh, motion of the planets around the sun um, are highly predictable. I mean, in fact, our conversation is taking place. You're, uh, here I'm in Santa Fe, and there you are in Sydney over, I don't know what it is, 15,000 miles, I, I don't even know any longer. But and we're a very large distance. And in real time, we can have this conversation because we have those equations which tell us exactly where the satellite is and we can bounce messages off uh, from me to that satellite to you and so forth and all this marvelous stuff can take place. And it works, as I said, like clockwork. But that sure as hell is not going to be the kind of thing that's going to happen in the rest of your day in Sydney. The rest of your day is going to have somewhat unpredictable aspects to it. And certainly, you know, if you tried to understand what's happening in Sydney today, you would, no one could ever predict all the multiple things that are going to be going on. And certainly not over the next year and so on. And that's the nature of a complex system. That it's, it's evolving, adapting, and often changes. It evolves into new things, and new, new forms emerge. And also that uh, associated with that um, is not just the sum of its components. You are not just the sum of all your cells. A city is not the sum of all the people that live in it or all the buildings that live in it. It's something to do with all of that, all interacting and so on. And so it's a very different beast, and it's very hard to define. I mean, that's what's interesting about it. It's very hard to define that in a rigorous way, but we certainly understand it in, a, in, a, in this kind of slightly colloquial, um, intuitive way. And, and in fact, the adaption, the, the fact that it adapts and evolves has meant that men, many of us Refer to not as complex systems, but complex adaptive systems. Emphasize that point. So, are all complex systems adaptive? No, they needn't be. No, and that's that's why there is this uh, distinction. distinction. There are, complexity has a funny history because uh, uh, until ooh, 20, 30 years ago, um, it was a term that wasn't used much, but uh, it, I think it did occur in the literature, but it was to do with um, nonlinear phenomena that occurred in mathematical equations. So it was, it was quite um, formalized, and uh, the culmination of that maybe is in um, ideas of chaos, um, that um, even though you have mathematics, this, this is sort of the exception to what I was talking about in terms of simplicity. Even though you have well-defined equations, the um, uh, time evolution of the system is not entirely predictable. Uh, and uh, we have this famous phenomenon that came, came to be known chaos that a, um, a small change in the initial conditions or in, even in a parameter can have exponentially big effects. And that meant that it was extremely difficult to make predictions. And, uh, you know, that image of uh, 
the butterfly flapping its wings in uh, Brazil causes a hurricane in Florida or some, you know, that kind of image. Um, and, um, and so uh, that is not considered adaptive, going back to your question. So there, it was considered, is considered complex. Um, but uh, the kinds of systems, beginning about 20, 30 years ago, uh, maybe longer, actually, maybe 30, 40 years ago, um, the interest began to switch um, to seriously thinking about systems that adapt, but thinking about them within a more physics-y, mathematical context. Because even though it wasn't called that, of course, all of biology is a complex system. <laughs> all of urban science is a complex system, and they're adaptive. Uh, but they, uh, but but the methodologies and the ways of thinking um, uh, typically did not involve uh, trying to put that into a mathematical framework. I mean, for example, Darwin's uh, theory of natural selection. Uh, which is fundamental to all of all of life, um, uh, is has never. Of course, there are ways of expressing it, but um, he certainly did not express it mathematically. Um, and indeed, and most biologists do not think about it mathematically. So that's something that biologists have thought about, and has now entered much more at this interface between. Mathematics, physics, and biology. And that interface, uh, did it first come to be at the Santa Fe Institute? Well, I think it was sort of, I mean, there were obviously lots of people thinking about this in, you know, or sort of edging around it. And um, it sort of came together in the early 80s um, through the, through the found, founding of the Santa Fe Institute, when people began to realize that there was this huge gap um, in, um, in the intellectual landscape that where uh, what's what we now call complex adaptive systems were sort of not being treated on their own merits. And in fact, um, just to back off a moment, um, from the physics side, there was this kind of arrogant attitude that, um, you know, once you have the fundamental equations of physics, all the rest will follow. You know, I mean, all you do is turn a crank and out will pop, you know, the geology of the earth, out will pop all of life. The theory all of everything to explain pop. everything. And the theory of everything, meaning everything. Yeah, that that's all you of, need. You know, all you need is the fundamental equations and the rest is engineering. Completely ridiculous idea. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and I have to tell you that um, probably um, when I was still doing that work, suddenly 30, 40 years ago, um, if I, you know, caught off guard, I would have said, yeah, that's probably true at some level, even though we may not ever be able to accomplish it. And now I think that's just not true. Um, and, and what we learned, what, we, what people began to realize was this interesting phenomenon of emergence, that out of at, at whatever level you're looking at, whatever resolution you're looking at, the dynamics that is taking place leads, can lead ultimately to something at a higher level that acts as if it's disconnected from the underlying dynamics. So for example, just to give a trivial example, um, a city, cities are something I've become very interested in, but you, you know, the dynamics of a city certainly depends upon you know, what's uh, the, 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 the social interactions of human beings but it doesn't care one iota about the fact that all those human beings are made of cells. You know, you need cells to make human beings, and therefore you would say you need cells to make cities. Well, of course, in some sense, you obviously do. But in fact, to understand anything of any interest whatsoever about a city, who gives a shit about whether 
human beings are made of cells or not, doesn't matter. So in that's, that's the sense of emergence. You see that, uh, uh, that human beings, this aspect of human beings um, ha- emerges from the underlying dynamics of cells, but you don't have to know about cells. And certainly that gets truly manifested in social organization and social behavior, where the fundamental cells don't matter, as is the case that the cells themselves don't care that ultimately, if I go deep enough, they're made of quarks and gluons and maybe even strings. It's irrelevant. And so that's, that was, it's sort of obvious in retrospect, but um, I think it was that recognition beginning in the 80s and the founding of the Santa Fe Institute that started to sim- stimulate this kind of thinking. And it was coupled with um, something else that is actually quite uh, profound in a way. That is, because computers were becoming more and more powerful, people could do simulations on computers where they would take you know, very simple models of uh, you know, agents um, and uh, put some um, little algorithm that tells you how those agents interact. Very simple algorithm, and let the thing run, just let the thing, the whole system run. And out of that would come what you would call complex behavior. You see, in, you, in fact, many claim that they could see evolutionary behavior and adaptive behavior. And, and I think uh, that gave credence to the idea that, my goodness me, maybe we can actually have a science of this and really start to address it in a more systematic and deeper way that would complement the canonical methodologies that have developed in the biological and social sciences. And it's a a field that brings together, as you said, biologists, physicists, economists, social scientists, computer scientists, sure. and they're all trying to understand these, these systems, these, these complex adaptive sure. systems. And the heart of it is where you are today, or at the, yeah, the Santa Fe Institute. And this is where yeah. a lot of these wonderful things have, have, have come from. So it's this, in a way, a crucible of, of thought and of different theories and ideas that are stitched together by, I guess, information, energy, and, well, lots of sweat. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, no, it's, I, I feel, of course, given my uh, present interests, I, uh, I feel very uh, flattered and honored to be able to be at this Santa Fe Institute. It's, it's a very unique place. It's not everybody's cup of tea, of course, but um, it's um, an Bit unusual place. A from England in terms of uh, weather, I'm sure. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, sure. No, in terms of <laughs> both the climate and the geography, it's sort of uh, completely opposite. I don't know, you know, it's, it's um, high desert. Um, you know, it's the base of the Rocky Mountains, actually. Um, but uh, so if I look out of the window here, there's mountains over here to the left with lots of pine forests and so on. But if I look in the other direction, I look way down into the Rio Grande Valley, which is a big rift valley, and that gets sort of scrub deserty. Mm. So it goes a very short distance. It covers very different kinds of uh, ecosystems and almost slightly different climates, but it's completely different than um, uh, England, for example, which is... So gentle and green and um, uh, drizzly, comforting, comforting and, 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 and drizzly. Here it's dry. We have, well, we, this is the kind of, we are in a monsoon season, so we get big storms. And if I look out there, I can see big storm. There's huge clouds building up and we have huge, thun- quite frightening thunderstorms. Yeah. There. I lived in Malaysia for a while, for 11 years, and we'd have afternoon storms that would just cause all life to stop, in a way. Everything yeah. would just have to pause for, for a few moments just because of the, the daily right. the exactly. lightning. It's, it's, uh, bewitching. And sometimes it's fine. No, it's quite extraordinary because sometimes it's actually, you know, it, it's, it's frightening, actually. Sometimes it's so powerful 
Um, you know, it's, it's kind of remarkable. But um, so this is the season and it goes on for maybe a couple more weeks. It's coming near the end. Mm. Um, but otherwise, um, so the rain here comes in deluge, so to speak, or snow. We get a lot of snow in the winter. And uh, whereas in England, of course, it just drizzles along uh, <laughs> continuously. <laughs> so how did you come to write the book Scale? Uh, I understand that you, you took an interest in, in uh, you could say, the physics of, of life. How yeah. did that lead to the, the, the writing of this wonderful book? I, I would say it's one of the, the best books, the most important books I've ever read. So congratulations on, on that. Mm -hmm. You've done a remarkable job. Um, so how, how, did it come to, how did it come to be? Okay. Well, first, thank you for your flattering remarks. Um, appreciate it, obviously. Um, well, it was a summary, really, of my uh, the work that I got involved in when I joined the Santa Fe Institute, when I started this transition um, out of high energy physics and into some of these questions in biology, and maybe we can discuss some of those in a while. But um, and I started working on those, and it. Uh, um, uh, and that led me to the Santa Fe Institute. And, um, uh, I, and that was quite successful uh, at the beginning. And that led to many other things, uh, about fundamental questions. I felt were fundamental questions about, you know, life. And then that led me to other fundamental questions about cities, urbanization, social life, socioeconomic life. And that led to questions of sustainability. And, um, and this is a period covering uh, maybe 20 years. And during that period, um, I was um, approached several times to write a book about some of this work because it had gotten quite a lot of um, attention in the uh, media. And um, so it, it, uh, many people knew about it. And I think also um, many aspects of it were um, things that caught a little bit, at least, the public imagination. And so people were, in, you know, people approached me about, why don't you write a book about this? And uh, uh, I, I resisted for quite a long while because I'm not a natural writer. It's not, I'm not someone that... Um, even enjoys writing, frankly, um, and it's a bit of a, a struggle for me. So I, just, I felt um, that, that I would never probably do it. But um, several things came together to eventually get me to write it. Uh, one was, um, uh, well, one of the major ones was that I was getting more and more concerned about uh, this whole question of sustainability. And I was um, very concerned that despite more attention being given to it, uh, it was all funneled in a sort of disciplinary way. All fun you know, that is, we talked about, people would talk about energy, and then they talk about water, then they talk about climate change, and all these, you know, and so on. They were all sort of divvied up, all salamied up. And one of the things that came out of all of my work was that, yes, of course, you, often, you typically have to do that. You have to focus on one kind of problem. But the characteristic of a complex adaptive system, and in particular, a, fu <laughs> a fundamental... A fundamental characteristic of uh, sustainability is that it has to be considered in a systemic, holistic framework that is crucial uh, because one of the things you learn quickly in, in dealing with complex adaptive systems, if you fiddle with one part of it, you think you're solving a problem locally, typically this has unpredictable, unintended consequences elsewhere. And the idea that we could solve the problems of the planet without at least trying to construct, develop 
a bigger holistic framework, I thought was um, a recipe for long-term failure. And so I felt I'd like to write a book that uh, talks about all the work that I've done. Um, and it would end up by saying, look, this is what I've learned from it. And just what I told you, but put it in um, a somewhat detailed and articulate way. And so the last part of that book um, is the one part that is possibly a little more speculative, but it is focused much more on that kind of issue. But it's bringing together um, uh, all the, you know, the, 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 the other 80% of the book is to do with sort of a, a much more rigorous way of attacking some of the fundamental problems in biology and socioeconomic life. So the book is titled Scale. What is scaling and how do these apparent these laws of scale um, manifest in the world? Sure. So um, it was called Scale because that's how I actually got into all this stuff when I was uh, doing, uh, still doing high energy physics. First of all, scaling, which means, simply put, you know, if I change the size of a system, if I double the size of a system, how do all of its characteristics change? Do all, its, all the various things that I can measure just double in size? Or do they change in some nonlinear fashion? Or is it entirely not predictable? So that's what scaling is about. And uh, it's played a very important role in physics and technology. Certainly in physics it has in terms of understanding fundamental elementary particles and the expansion of the universe. I mean, the expansion of the universe and the Big Bang is a scaling phenomenon. How did the universe scale from being something tiny, minuscule, up to the size it is today? That's you know, what happened. And, and what were the uh, principles and equations governing that? So it's played a very important role in physics, but also in technology, because obviously, um, you know, when people invent things, invent machinery, machines, or invent artifacts, uh, and you go to manufacture them, you have the whole problem of scaling up whatever it is that you're making, not only scaling it up in size itself, scaling up uh, the, the, um, the manufacturing process. So it's, uh, so it, it's, you know, it's there in the background of almost everything we do. So um, it turns out the work that I've been involved in was uh, in, in physics was um, some of it anyway, had been focused on some of these ideas. And uh, I began to be interested at the same time in the 90s in um, mid-90s uh, in questions in biology, be partly because um, I was in my mid-50s uh, at that stage, my life, and I happened to come from a family of very short-lived males. Um, my father died at 61, his father at 54, and so on. And we never, <laughs> all my uncles died young, and I sort of grew up without actually even thinking very much about it, that I would live to about 60. And, you know, that would be it. And then one day I suddenly realized, my God, I'm 55. <laughs> Maybe I only have, you know, five to 10 years maximum to live. Um, and maybe I should start thinking about that a little bit. Um, and, uh, but that sort of got me thinking about, you know, what is it? you know, why is it that we die? Why is it that we age? Why is it that I'm, you know, slowing down that my, you know, it's obvious if you look at me, um, I look in my 50s. I don't look like I did, like you do. You know, I don't look all young and, <laughs> you know, what the hell's, why did that happen? And, and most importantly, from a physicist's viewpoint, why, what sets the scale of 100 years of the order of magnitude for the lifespan of a human being. You know, where in the hell does that 100 years come from? And uh, so I started reading about that. I learned that actually um, biologists 
really hadn't thought a lot about it. I mean, you know, there is a field of, of um, I guess maybe it's called gerontology, but, you know, there's, there's compared to everything else about life, you know, birth, um, our, our physiology, um, our, um, our growth, um, our, our dealing with disease, all these things where there's tomes and, you know, huge departments. There are no departments dealing with getting old, basically. And there are very few journals. And I was shocked to discover that. And I was also shocked to learn that, you know, a lot of the explanations were the classic one, but it's sort of genetic, you know, it's controlling genes, which is sort of meaningless. You know, I mean, so what does that mean? You know, so what, what is mechanistically going on? Those bloody genes, they're just molecules. How do they know? And they're, they're microscopic. How do they know that this whole body has to sort of disappear within 100 years? It's sort of bizarre in a way. So I started thinking about that. And um, that's what turned out, thinking about that actually changed my life because I started to ask the question as a physicist, and I thought, you know, if, um, if you're to understand why a system collapses, why it ages and collapses, dies, um, you've obviously got to understand what the hell it is that's keeping it alive in the first place. Because, because then, if you can understand sort of how it's sustaining itself, you can start to figure out what is going wrong, what can go wrong, and how does it go wrong. So um, that meant that you had to understand metabolism, because metabolism is, is the key to life. That is uh, the process by which we take food, we eat, we do something inside our bodies biochemically, turning that into energy that's a very extremely complex biochemical process, takes place inside our cells, that produces a chemical called ATP, that's a short for some very fancy chemical, and that ATP is sort of just the currency of energy. That's the thing that actually supplies the energy to all of your cells and therefore to your entire body. And, and so what you're doing when you're eating and metabolizing ATP, and then you're using that energy to do all the things that you do, and most importantly, to keep you alive. And what does keeping alive mean? And that's what I, I suddenly realized. Keeping alive simply means that um, uh, that energy, if you didn't do any, if you didn't walk and talk, if you just sat still, you would still need energy to stay alive because all those processes that are going on inside your body are what we call dissipative. That is, they're using energy to overcome friction, overcome damage, overcome wear and tear that's going on in your body as molecules are exported um, through cells as more, um, uh, more macroscopically, as blood is flowing through your arterial system. All these are creating wear and tear. And in fact, most of the energy, most of the food that you're, using, you're eating is just to overcome that and repair that. And uh, in physics terms, that's called that wear and tear process is called entropy. And there's a fundamental law of physics. It is the most fundamental law of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, which says it doesn't matter how efficient you try to be, you're always going to have, in this language, you're always going to have wear and tear, you're always going to produce entropy, always. So in a certain sense, it's inevitable that the system is going to collapse. And the only question is, can you put that into a serious mathematical framework? So that was the task I set myself. And in so doing, I came across something I found remarkable, and those were scaling laws in biology. And they go by the technical phrase of a law. 
and the most fundamental of which is in, indeed to do with metabolism. And it was discovered um, in the 1930s by a biologist named Max Kleiber in California. And um, he discovered this extraordinary scaling law. So what he plotted was the, uh, your metabolism, your metabolic rate, which for these purposes just means how much food you need each day just to stay alive. So for us, it's somewhere around maybe 2,000 calories, okay, food calories. And, uh, and uh, you know, for other animals, it's different, of course, different amounts. And he took those amounts, amount the metabolic rate for each animal, and he plotted it versus their weight. And he discovered that there was a very simple mathematical law that this obeyed, that um, it wasn't sort of arbitrary. It was as if it was some fixed law that if you tell me the size of an animal, well, in particular a mammal, let's just say with mammals to keep it simple, you tell me the size of a mammal, I can tell you how much food it needs to eat each day to stay alive. I can tell you its metabolic rate. And um, I found that remarkable when I learned about that because, um, uh, well, let me, let me come back to that in a minute. But the other thing I then learned was, and me, well, no, maybe I should first tell you what that law is. Maybe I should say what that law is. That law is the following. That uh, at the most naive level, you might think that if you simply doubled the size of an organism, well, you would double the number of cells. You would need twice as much energy, twice as much food, because you have twice as many cells. Well, Kleiber's law about metabolic rate was that, no, you don't actually need twice as much. Systematically, you only need, roughly speaking, 75% much, as much. So if you went from two grams to four grams, or whether you went from two kilograms to four kilograms, or 2,000 kilograms to 4,000 kilograms, doesn't matter, just double it anywhere. You always only need this 75%. So this three quarters uh, scaling law um, was somehow fundamental to life. And what was later discovered, Kleiber did it mostly for mammals, but it turns out it's true for all animals. In fact, not only all animals, it's true for all plants. It's the same thing for all, I mean, I'm looking out the window, and there's a forest out there of plants and trees. They satisfy the same law. One that's doubled the size of another only needs 75% metabolic energy. And uh, that was amazing, but even more amazing was that uh, I learned that if you looked at any physiological variable or characteristic, meaning something like um, uh, the length of your aorta, that's the first tube that comes out of your heart, or um, uh, the, um, uh, the height of a tree, or the, um, how long even did you live, as we were talking about before, how long does it take to reach maturity, anything that you can measure about an organism and you plot it versus its weight, it satisfies a similar systematic scaling law. And the, um, in, with the same kind of characteristics of this kind of 75%, sometimes it's 25%, but it's always some multiple of 25%. It's always some multiple of one quarter. So these became known as quarter power allometric scaling laws. And there's probably, I don't know, 50, 75 of these laws covering everything that you can measure in, across life, whether it's within cells, whether it's across mammals, whether it's across insects, whether it's across ecosystems. There's this extraordinary regularity. And now going back to what I was going to say earlier, this is truly amazing because we believe in natural selection. We believe that every organism 
has its own unique evolutionary history that everything is historically contingent based on, you know, in the most naive way, and a whole bunch of historical accidents that's led to the extraordinary diversity of life around us. That's all come from, you know, competition, survival of the fittest, finding uh, the right niche and adapting to it and so forth. And all of these details, and somehow, despite all of that historical contingency, despite the extraordinary diversity of the environment, and despite all of the historical aspects of evolution, somehow these laws (laughs) have persisted. And so the question begs itself, what in the hell is going on and where did they come from? And mm-hmm. that's the world I got involved in, was yeah, to seems, understand that. Yeah, it, it seems like these, when, you, when I think about it, it's like there's, a, there's this scaffolding that life kind of builds itself on top of, or that it, 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 it's, 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 just, it's as if we have this tree, and these, this tree is yeah. made of these laws, and the, the intricacies or like the that's details true. of life hang themselves from it, but the tree itself is... Uh, is continuous across all forms of life. Um, That's right. So so put it slightly differently. I put it, yes, that's a much more, um, um, that's a wonderful way of putting it. Mine is much more um, uh, skeletal, (laughs) if you like. (laughs) Mine is, but you know, the, so to speak, anything that you can measure about an organism um, is in this sense, predictable up to a sort of 80, 90% level. You know, so if you want to know anything about an organ, you, you give me the size of a mammal, and I can tell you almost everything about it, um, about its physiology, its life history, how many offspring it's going to have, and so on. Um, uh, and it would be correct to about, to about 80, 90% level. And um, it's that the details... And the diversity that we see is actually only at the level of that kind of 10, 15 percent. And um, but you know, I, I was going to say one other thing. I meant to add there are some remarkable things that you discover when you look at these scaling laws, and one that that intrigued me tremendously because that was my interest that got me into this, namely aging and mortality, was that lifespan scales according to these quarter pound scaling laws. And um, it does it in a way that is exactly opposite to the way in which heart rates decrease. Heart rates decrease the bigger you are. An elephant's heart beats systematically slower than ours, and ours beats systematically slower than a mouse's. Uh, But they do so in such a way that if you were to multiply the heart rate times the lifespan, it would be the same for everybody. So what does that mean? Heart rate times lifespan means the number of heartbeats in a lifetime. So what it says is something that is really Slow down and relax. That's what it says. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's one thing it tells you. But it also tells you that, that the number of heartbeats in a lifetime is the same for a shrew which is, you know, smaller than the palm of my hand, which lives for about just over a year, it has the same number of heartbeats as the whale, which is bigger than, you know, I don't know probably the building you're in, um, and uh, lives for maybe 125 years. But they have the same number of heartbeats. So their pace of life, everything is adjusted accordingly. So the thing that you learn from these standing laws, everything has evolved co-evolved together so that the scaling laws are always beautifully obeyed up to the statistical level of 80, 90 percent, um, so that everything sort of fits together in this lovely mathematical framework. And, uh, you know, so that uh, when I learned about that, I was first of all amazed that it wasn't sort of uh, first of all, the, the biologists weren't, in fact, biologists had spent an enormous amount of energy on it in the 
30s, the 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and it then went um, sort of onto the back burner with the coming of the molecular revolution and the discovery of DNA and all the rest of the stuff, genetics and so forth. And that put it all sort of on the back burner. And it was, um, I mean, it was, of course, well known, uh, but it wasn't paid much attention to. And I suppose uh, one of my contributions with my wonderful colleagues, I uh, teamed up with a marvelous, fantastic uh, biologist named Jim Brown, and his then student, Brian Lindquist, was one of maybe our major contributions was simply to bring that from the back burner to the front burner and say, look, guys, this is extraordinary. You know, it says that it isn't just sort of arbitrary and capricious and chaotic. There's actually, you know, tremendous systematic regularity. And what we did was explain where that regularity came from uh, mathematically, why it was that way. That would have been so exciting just to... to... And it was, yes. Oh, yeah, that would have been... Absolutely. Maybe I'll just say a couple of... Should I, should I speak a few words about what the theory is? Why, please, please, why please. These things... yes. yes. Let me just say a few words just in, uh, conceptually. I mean, I, it's mathematical, so I can only, and I can only use colloquial English. But um, the idea... So the first thing that you realize is there's something remarkable not just about the fact that these laws exist, but that um, uh, they cut across completely different um, evolved designs of animals. I mean, um, we're not fish, mammals are not fish, and fish are not trees, and yet they're satisfying the same laws. So you ask yourself, what is it that is common among all of life, doesn't matter what the design is. And you quickly realize, well, the major challenge of all of life, going back to our earlier discussion of complex adaptive systems and what complex systems are, is that you have enormous number of components. Let's just call them cells for purposes of this. And um, they have to be sustained in a relatively efficient and democratic fashion um, in order for the entire organism to function. I mean, after all, we have, you know, we're made of roughly um, about 100 trillion cells. Well, that's just, you know, it's fantastic. And they have to be coherent. And they, as I say, they have to be sustained in a democratic way. Well, it's obvious in a way that uh, what's, what, um, life has taken advantage of, it has evolved just simple branching networks that um, feed all of those cells. I mean, and so, you know, uh, when you think of yourself, um, biologically, you realize from this viewpoint that uh, you're a bunch of these networks, your circulatory system, your renal system, your neural system, your respiratory system, even your bones have this kind of hierarchical structure. Um, and, uh, and that's true at all scales. That's true within your cells. Uh, it's true across ecosystems. And it's true of all of life. All of life can be thought of as um, functioning via um, transportation of energy and information through these networks. And uh, so the idea was that uh, these laws arise because of the generic, universal, mathematical, and physical properties of these networks, which transcends design. That is, so let's just give me, I'll give you two examples uh, of, of what I mean by that. One is that um, these networks have to be what we call space filling. That is, they have to fill all of the space where the organism is because that's where all the cells are. Every, you know, the network, your circulatory system, um, almost by definition, has to have a capillary ending near every cell. So your whole body is covered with capillaries, of course, in order to feed all the cells. But those capillaries are can to this network, which eventually, if you trace it back, of course, goes to your aorta and to your heart and that's who you are, but all networks have 
a property analogous to that. So that's called space filling, and that has to be put in the mathematical term. Um, another, and, and that you see transcends the design. It doesn't matter what design you have, whether you are a plant or a, a tree or a, or a fish or a mammal, uh, that concept of space filling has to, will be the same. Similarly, another one is, which is a very strong but powerful one, is that um, of all possible networks that could have evolved, networks that have evolved uh, by the continuous feedback mechanisms inherent in natural selection um, because of competition, um, the ones that have evolved are ones that in some way have optimized the system. So let me give you a specific example. So the circulatory system that we all share, and by we, I don't just mean all human beings, every single mammal shares the same circulatory system, basically. But the ones that we all share um, have evolved to minimize the amount of energy your heart has to put out per second in order to pump blood through the system to supply your cells, to keep you alive. So you want to minimize the amount of energy that you expend on keeping yourself alive in order to maximize the amount of energy you can devote to reproduction, to sex, reproduction, and the raising of children, that which is loosely called Darwinian fitness. That's the metric of, uh, of, of um, evolution. And so um, you have to put that into mathematical language. And you see that concept, again, transcends whatever the design is. doesn't tell you, doesn't depend on the kind of design. It just says whatever the design is, you need to minimize the amount of energy being expended um, in order to do the function, uh, the, the fundamental function of biological life, namely um, uh, um, promote uh, the succession of gene. So um, all of that had to be put into mathematics. And that's a bit of a tour de force, but uh, that was done eventually. And when that was done, out popped all of the scaling laws. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Uh, and um, so that was, uh, that was uh, uh, very nice and, um, and very enjoyable, by the way. And uh, and gave this sort of fundamental explanation for this extraordinary regularity. And what was also nice about it, and I don't think it's been appreciated enough by people, even those that <laughs> like the work very much, and that is it is linked to the ideas of natural selection. It's not in any way in opposition to it. It says these are actually derivable, in a sense, from natural selection. They, you know, the, the idea that you need to supply every unit and that you need to maximize fitness. So, anyway, so that's what, if you're inefficient, you're not going to have that energy to use to procreate or to, to do whatever, exactly. and there's a less chance of exactly. you surviving. Yeah. Exactly. And so that's the survival of the fittest, those that are most efficient. So, that's another, that's another way of putting it the survival of the fittest is the survival in this language of the efficient, uh, the efficient use of energy and resources. Um, so what was nice about that is now we had this mathematical theory and we could apply it to many things. And it was applied to um, uh, growth, for example. Why is it we grow? You know, how do we grow? Why is it we stop? I mean, that's a fundamental question. Why do we stop growing? Why do we go on eating You know, when you're young? Uh, when you're a child, adolescent even, you, you, got, you eat and you keep on growing um, ontogenetically. Um, uh, but then uh, before you're 20 years old, you somehow stop, even though you go on eating the same amount uh, and uh, you stay pretty much the same size. Why is that? So that theory in that. Um, we, uh, what did we, other things we understood, rates of evolution, we understood uh, sleep. Why is it you sleep? Why is it, I mean, for example, why is it that we have to sleep eight hours a night and a mouse has to sleep 16 hours a night, but an elephant only sleeps four hours a night? 
why is it we live 100 years? Well, I started the conversation with, and a mouse is dead after two, three. You know, where does that come from? So that was, we can explain. Now, all these things were derivative from the, the, the fundamental theory that was trying to understand the scaling laws. So it's, there's a large body of work, and uh, that large body of work constituted maybe the first half of my book that you referred to earlier. <clears throat> but in a language, and, and in a language, and the great challenge for me in writing that book was uh, to do it uh, without using any mathematics whatsoever, but feel that I was still doing justice to the ideas and the work. And the book tries very hard to emphasize the concepts and the thought processes that lead to the explanation and to the phenomena that are observed. So, uh, and so some of these things I did not discuss in the book. The book was getting too long. I didn't discuss sleep. Uh, some of the work, we've done a lot of work on cancer. Um, uh, that was not in the book either. But many of these other things are in the book. Uh, so that formed a very nice body of work, which we still, I still work on. I'm still working on uh, mm. a lot of that stuff. But uh, the other side of it, which is the extension to cities and urbanization. Yeah, I'd, l- I'd love to come to uh, cities and urbanization. But before we go to that, uh, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, terminal units and networks and how there's consistency across. Uh, well, across all forms of life, but also, you know, in things like cities. Could you describe what a terminal unit is? Uh, yes, yes. So I, I say, yes, maybe I, let me expand on that a little bit. So I, I, I don't know what words exactly I used, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes ago when I introduced it, uh, the idea of space filling and so on. The, so the network ends in something that we just simply call terminal unit. So in a circulatory system, that is uh, a capillary. Um, in um, a plant or a tree, that is technically called a petiole. Petiole is the last little tiny branch uh, to which a leaf is attached. Um, uh, and those are called terminal units. And um, one of, and, and all of the, of course, um, all of networks obviously have terminal units. And um, one of our postulates that we made uh, was that, look, these terminal units play a very fundamental role in the network because um, they're not just the end of the network, but they are the interface of the network with whatever it's supplying. Sometimes it's the external world. I mean, like the leaf connects to a leaf of a tree, which connects with, of course, the, with the external world. But it, inside, inside our bodies, it's a capillary, so to speak, connecting with cells. You know, but it is the interface where energy is transferred, um, typically. And, of course, in the brain, it's the neuron and... Uh, and that's where information is exchanged, axons, axons and so forth. So um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of universal property. And the thing that we postulated, which was really um, sticking our necks out, was that for a given type of network within a given uh, taxon of animals, say all mammals, fish, the terminal unit is an invariant. It does not change across the whole spectrum of sizes of that taxonomic group. So let's stay with mammals, that the capillaries of the circulatory system of a mouse are, to all intents and purposes, identical to the capillaries you and I share and are identical to the capillaries that a blue whale has, even though a blue whale is, uh, you know, 10 million times more massive than a mouse. Um, But so you've scaled up the whole system, but you've kept these terminal units fixed. Now, why is that? Now, that's another part that comes from natural selection. When you evolve a new species, 
natural selection does not, within the same taxonomic group, natural selection does not reinvent the fundamental units. These are kind of the fundamental building blocks and natural selection does not reinvent those every time. It uses those as a given and builds up on those. And that was the idea. And um, it turns out that is true. I mean, that is roughly speaking correct. That if you look at uh, networks, vast scales of sizes, um, the, for, for example, capillaries are pretty much the same whether you're a, a shrew, a mouse, a human being, or an elephant. So, um, and um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, but um, if we take that over to cities, you could argue that, uh, you know, in terms of networks, in terms of social networks, um, each human being is sort of the terminal unit of a network. That's where the social network ends, but it also begins, if you like. But, you know, the network ends on each, on, on each individual. And, in fact, um, you're not part of a city if the social network of the city doesn't end on you. You're not, part, you're not a citizen of that city, obviously, because you're not interacting with any, anyone else. So it's sort of a, a, a very simplistic observation. Um, and similarly, in terms of infrastructure, um, you could say a dwelling a house, for want of a better word, but each dwelling um, uh, where a human being lives um, is a total unit of um, inf some of the, the infrastructural networks. For example, uh, um, if you consider transportation network, road networks, um, Every house, um, uh, I mean, the, the, the road network has to end at every house. I mean, otherwise you can't get to your house. I mean, there has to, it might be a little lane, it may be, you know, but it has to end, that's it. Otherwise, again, you're not part of the city. You're not part of it. If you're just isolated, you're not part of it. Um, there has to be at least a path, something that connects you, and that's, term, that's, a, that's a terminal unit of the network, and that's roughly speaking also an invariant within a given urban system. So that's the idea, and it's a very, it's a very generic kind of uh, um, thing. And by the way, I, I do want to emphasize something. Um, this terminal units, I say is invariant, means it doesn't change. Of course, if you look in detail, if, even if you look in detail at your own individual capillaries, and you certainly look across all of mammals, of course you'll find uh, you know, some capillaries a little bit bigger than others, some smaller. There might even be factors of two. But the point is, and that's part of the paradigm, part of the philosophy of this, that is tiny. That change of changing by even 50% is tiny compared to the range of scale of 100 million, which are, over which you're looking at all mammals. All mammals, if you go from a shrew to a blue whale, the range of size is that of 100 million, 10 to the power eight. Uh, and so a, 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 a capillary length that changes by 50% is completely lost in that. So that you have to keep that in mind in this. So uh, cities are also examples of complex adaptive systems, but they have characteristics that are slightly, or that, that are different to that of uh, life. Could, could you talk about what those differences are and how they take shape? Sure. Yeah, so you know, when, when we had done this work, um, being a physicist especially, uh, you know, one of the characteristics of physics is you you know, you try to generalize everything. <laughs> sometimes it's possible, but sometimes it works. And so here, uh, when we've done a lot of this work and applied it to different uh, uh, phenomena, um, um, it occurred to me, well, maybe, you know, we can apply it to cities and even companies. Actually, companies were the first thing I thought about, but also cities. 
because they're obviously network systems and they're kind of organic. They grow and they do many other things that organisms do. And indeed, there's a long history in the literature on cities that often talks about them in biological terms. And in fact, in the modern literature, you know, in the you know, especially journalistic literature, biological metaphors are used all the time. You know, the DNA of a city, the ecology of the marketplace, metabolism of a city, you know, the, these words are used. Um, and so at some stage, I teamed up with a couple of very good social scientists um, to start thinking about this. And, um, uh, and, and unlike in biology, um, one of the things that had helped me enormously when I first got into this in biology was that a lot of the data analysis, a lot of what we call phenomenology, um, analyzing all of the data um, had been done because of going back to Kleiber's law in the 30s and all the work that was done in the uh, later in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on, way up into the 80s, um, had um, uh, systematized many of these scaling laws. So it was there in books and so forth. Cities, on the other hand, almost no one had been thinking along these lines. Um, there was a little bit done um, in terms of population size and so on, but, uh, uh, but in terms of the real um, dynamical characteristics of cities, um, nothing had been done. So um, I got together a team of extremely good young people who were very good at, uh, they were not only good scientists, but very good at uh, computation and doing data analyses. And um, together, um, we uh, started looking at multiple data sets on cities to ask just a very simple question, do cities scale? And um, in the sense that biology scales. So just going back to uh, the biology, so one way of putting it, and I pretty much already said it, look, even though you know, um, the whale lives in the ocean and the elephant has a big trunk and uh, we walk on two legs and the mouse scurries around and we all look sort of different. Um, in fact, in terms of actually measuring anything, we're at this 80, 90% actually scaled versions of one another. You know, I mean, that's who we are. Um, so, um, you know, as I said earlier, you give me all the characteristics of a mouse, I can tell you all the physiological characteristics of a giraffe, except for its long neck. <laughs> um, or I, I used to put it kind of sarcastically uh, in the following way. People might ask, why aren't there tiny elephants? And I would say, there are tiny elephants. We call them mice. <laughs> <laughs> That's what tiny elephants are. If you made, in other words, if you tried to make an elephant the size of a mouse, it would be a mouse. <laughs> so anyway, um, so the question is, if you look at cities, is there something similar? That is, even though I'll use, I have to use American cities, um, if you, um, if, is New York a scaled up Los Angeles, which is a scaled up Chicago, which is a scaled up Santa Fe. Santa Fe is where I live, it's a small town. Um, but even though they're in different geographies, they're different parts of the country, they have different histories, they have different cultures, etc. But, you know, maybe they're like animals that uh, despite that, uh, you know, the history, geography, and culture maybe are secondary to something fundamental that we could just call cityness that all those cities have, because all those cities, we recognize them as cities because they have roads and they have uh, automobiles and they have businesses and they have people and they have houses. They everywhere. All the cities have all the same things. And, you know, that, if you start thinking about it, that dominates. So maybe, in fact, it is like animals 
And like animals, they have evolved. And, you know, to some extent, they've evolved by a sort of process of natural selection. There's been competition, and they have to adapt to their individual niches and so forth. And so maybe it's not so crazy, this biological metaphor, but let's see if we can put it into rigorous mathematical terms. We looked at all the characteristics that have been measured about cities that we could lay our hands on and plotted them versus the size of a city. And the size of a city, we just used population as the metric. And we found, uh, remarkably, that uh, cities scale. They, namely, that when you plot them, they all sort of lie, roughly speaking, on one curve. When plotted appropriately, they lie on one line. And uh, there was more, just a side comment, there was more variance. There was more variance around the, the, the best fit to the data than there was among animals. But that wasn't surprising because animals and plants have, have been evolving over not just hundreds of thousands, but in some cases, hundreds of millions of years. Lots of time for these feedback processes and optimization to take place. But cities have only been around for hundreds of years, in some cases, a few thousand years, but in most cases, hundreds. Uh, of years, and in the United States, for uh, some, not much more than 100 years. And if we're thinking about Australia, even less, probably. So, <laughs> but, what? Uh, for some I was agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. But Australia, we've only, we've been, we're a very new country. <laughs> Just a blink of a day. Yeah, of course. Much yep. new, even newer than the United States. So, but anyway, we collected this data and we found that cities scale, but we found something. Extremely interesting. When we looked at the infrastructure, like transport, you know, length of all the roads, um, the length of the electrical lines, the gas lines, the number of gasoline stations, et cetera, all these things that are very infrastructural, sort of have analogs in biology. They're like circulatory systems. Lo and behold, we found they scaled mathematically in an identical fashion to organisms, except that instead of having this 25% that I mentioned earlier, that is every time you double the size of the speak with its metabolism, you save 25%. Um, you only need 75% more. For cities, um, every time you doubled, you save 15%. So every time you double, you save 15% on infrastructure. And I didn't say this for organisms, but uh, that's usually referred to as an economy of scale. So organisms manifest an extraordinarily systematic economy of scale given by this 25% rule with each doubling. Cities also satisfy a, um, a systematic economy of scale, but by only 15%. I mean, every time I double, I don't need twice as much infrastructure. I double the size of the population. I don't actually need twice as many roads, twice as many much length of roads. I don't need twice as many gas stations. I don't need twice as long electrical lines. I only need 85% more. So there's great efficiency, great savings, the bigger the city. Bigger city, in that sense, bigger cities are better. I'm saying anything about quality of life, but just in terms of pure energy saving and so forth. So that was fascinating that it was very much like biology. But what was much more fascinating was when we looked at socioeconomic metrics. And these are metrics that don't exist in biology. And they probably didn't, maybe as far we know, they didn't exist in the universe till, you know, beginning about 10,000 years ago when people discovered language and started forming collectives and communities and cities and urbanization, social networks, um, and um, forming a socioeconomic dynamic. And so things like wages, 
things like um, uh, number of educational institutions, numbers of restaurants, number of patents produced, ideas, ideas being produced, um, and so on. So all the things that are to do with socioeconomic activity, and in particular, to do with social interaction. These don't exist in biology. These are something new and very unique to human beings and modern human beings. When we looked at those metrics, we discovered something uh, that as I found amazing at the time, was that we found scaling. Let's talk about the number of patents. The number of patents is a function of city size, scales in a systematic way with city size, but it scales in a way which we dubbed super linear. And that meant that instead of the bigger you are, the less you need per capita, economy of scale, we discovered that the bigger you are, the more you have per capita in a city, the more patents that is produced. And in fact, what we discovered was that if you double the size of a city, you don't just double the number of patents, you actually more than double the size by about 15%. So there was this sort of value added of about 15% with every doubling. But what was remarkable, that was true, the same, roughly speaking, 15% was the same for every socioeconomic quantity, whether it was good, like patents, or what we call bad and ugly, like the number of the degree of crime, or the number of AIDS or flu cases. Um, so all of these increased by the same 15% with every doubling. That was remarkable. And uh, then to add even more so to that was we discovered that this was the same, not wasn't just true of the United States, but it was true for all countries for which we could get data for other countries in the Americas, other, you know, South American countries, Brazil and Colombia and Mexico and Chile, uh, but also European countries, uh, Asian countries, uh, Japan, and China. Um, I don't remember if we had Australian data. I just don't remember, actually. We do have some Australian data because I, um, uh, of... Um, Yes, we do. We do have data, and I think that all, I feel like also it'd be anomalous, uh, just because of the population density and yeah. No, actually, the ones that were interesting. What I wanted to do, and we still haven't done. Um, I was less interested in. I hate to say this, to <laughs> less interested in Australia than I was, funnily enough, in Canada and Chile, because they're unique in that they are one-dimensional countries. If you see what I mean, I mean that is Chile which is 3,000 miles long. I mean, it's as mm -hmm. long as the United States is wide, but it's only about 50 miles deep. And it's all, you know, on a line. So it's very interesting. And Canada, which is enormous, but in fact, all of urbanization in Canada is along the U.S.-Canadian border. I mean, there's no cities. I mean, Edmonton is the only city that's more than 25 miles north of the border. So... Um, uh, but we don't, unfortunately, no one's ever done the analysis to see if there's, you could actually see that in the data. Anyway, hmm. this is, of course, a side, yeah. this is a tangential remark. <laughs> but anyway, the, the fundamental thing is cities scaled, but they bifurcated and were more complex than biological life in that in addition to the canonical economy of scale, sublinear scaling, they had this superlinear scaling um, of the bigger you are, the more you have per capita, whatever it is, um, by about 15%. And that was fascinating. And it, of course, raised the same kind of questions it did in biology. Where in the hell does all this come from? And uh, that is actually still a work in progress because we, it's certainly we're convinced, and I think we have very strong arguments and mathematics that back it up and comparison with data, that it is um, uh, a result of networks. But this time, and this is what makes it complicated, there are two kinds of networks now for cities. Um, there's canonical infrastructural networks, you know, roads and all the things I was talking about. 
But now there are social networks, you know, which are sort of more virtual, more, I don't know, uh, <laughs> you know, not, not quite as physical. I mean, that is what we're doing now, interacting. And so you have to, and what you realize is a city is the integration of those two networks. Because even though, um, you know, you, you, may have, and you may have seen, I'm sure you've seen pictures of social networks where you have an individual node and then there's all these lines that connect it, connect that individual with his or her friends, and that forms a social network. <clears throat> what is forgotten in those diagrams and which is absolutely essential in thinking about cities is each one of those nodes, each individual has to be in some place. It has to be sitting, some, you know, you have to be sitting in a room, in an office, in your kitchen. But furthermore, you also have to move. You have to go from A to B. You have to go to work, you have to go to the store. So this makes it very complicated. But um, uh, uh, we have made some progress on that. And I think there's a, you know, but it's not quite at the sophisticated level it is for cities. But similar kinds of principles hold. Yeah. And, uh, and some of the predictions, by the way, I didn't talk about that for biology. You know, science advances by having theories that explain things that have already been measured, but then makes predictions of things that haven't been measured and I didn't mention that in biology but there's, we have some of those examples but we've done that also for cities without having a complete theory uh, we've made predictions about social networks from these scaling laws and um, those have been tested in a wonderful way at least I, I found it so intriguing and that is using uh, mobile phone data that, uh, you know, there's, we were able to get hold of. Well, I had collaborators at MIT who, were, who had access to um, billions and billions of these uh, phone call data from the telephone companies, big, really big data sets, and uh, using those to um, uh, look at the social network and also where people are. And it turned out, uh, we made predictions for that, which agreed extremely well with the analysis from mobile phone data. So that kind of work is still very much ongoing. All of this work is very strongly ongoing. I just uh, have, I've got a question about uh, money. Money is the lifeblood of, of cities uh, and yes. of social life in a way. Uh, have, has, have people thought about it in terms of information and energy? And what, what are your thoughts on like, the role that money plays in, in these networks? Well, that is a very good and very challenging question. The one, what I don't think there's any, there's no definitive answer. You know, the, the whole question of what is money is one that plagues economics. I mean, what is money? Um, and it certainly is part of this because, um, as you say, it flows either either explicitly or implicitly in these networks, and we certainly use uh, money as one of the metrics. For example, we look at GDP of cities and so forth, um, and we translate some things into dollar value and so forth. Um, but it's a fundamental question in economics and in social behavior which no one has answered satisfactorily. Because the original idea, of course, of money was that it was just a proxy for the exchange of goods. But somehow it isn't that anymore because we have this, uh, we, we invest and, we, and money kind of goes. And yeah. most people become, most, pe most of the billionaires um, on this planet have become billionaires with nothing to do with true exchange of goods or working hard. I mean, that's what money was. Money was a reward for labor and therefore a one-to-one -one correspondence with energy or with material. I mean, there was a sort of, I mean, presumably there was a time when there was a exact translation, so to speak. <laughs> 
Well, that obviously isn't true any longer. And uh, it's it, it, it's the serious. Even when, when people call GDP, it's the gross domestic product. It's supposed to be all the goods that are produced, but it then is put in terms of dollars. And so there's an assumption there that has been used that there is a translation, but it's not, not highly non-trivial. And even more so in terms of the other part of your question, which is its relationship to information, especially now. I mean, it was even true before IT and so on. But, um, you know, is the, the, the dollar value of information content and different kinds of information. And um, we struggle with that. And uh, one of the things that um, I was intrigued about in our data, which is which got me actually thinking about this originally, was that it turns out that um, both the pat- number of patents produced per year, number of patents produced, um, is scales with this 15% in the same way GDP, which says that if you thought of patents as a proxy for idea, ideas, and therefore of information exchange, I mean, taking again um, uh, speculatively that, that information lead, you cannot have ideas without information exchange, that information, information content that has gone to patents um, is a one-to-one correspondence with the amount of goods being produced in the city. So it's sort of returning it to this simplistic idea mm. that there is a simple exchange. And uh, so I've been, I've struggled. I don't know the answer. And I think it's a, it remains a fundamental question. I'm certainly not unique in uh, not having a simple answer. I mean, there's books, toes written on this question in the past. It's just funny. You know, we hit, we say there's that, well, there's that saying that money makes the world go round. And yet we just have right. a real idea about, well, what it is and how it actually makes the world go round and what it maps onto in the, in the real world. We have intuitions and ideas, uh, but I'm, I'd be, I'm just very curious about how it, thinking about it in terms of information and, and energy, it, it kind of exists, yeah. it kind of acts as like, um, as, 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 as energy in a way. If you, if you put money in a certain place, things happen. You, know, you, you put money, it's like, it's water at a trough, it's, uh, it's food. And you, we kind of, I see what we do as society as we use it. It's a, it's a way of incentivizing and rewarding people for doing things that are universally uh, beneficial. Um, and it begets itself. It's like this, I don't know. Oh, absolutely. It exponentiates. It tends to exponentiate so that, um, you know, uh, the, richest, the richest universities tend to be, um, you know, the most creative and productive. The, the richest football teams come, you know, uh, the top of the leagues and so on. And, um, you know, there's no accident. Yeah. Um, you know, and, um, and it's, it's slightly depressing, actually, but it's the, that is the way the world works, of course. Mm. Uh, so I, I'm mindful of, of, our, of our time. Um, I'm just wondering, I'd love to go on to the, the most important topic in a way, um, but through this discussion of cities and talk about sustainability and what okay. our understanding of cities, uh, if, if, if you could talk about what our understanding of cities and, and how they scale means for sustainability uh, in the near no. to hopefully long term. Yes. Okay, so let me talk about that and I'll try to be quick. So I want to go back to autism first. Uh, so I said in passing that, you know, we created this theory, this theoretical framework, in which we can calculate many things. And one thing I mentioned in passing was that we can understand growth, growth of an organism and why we stop growing. And so to cut a long story short, the way growth works is uh, you, you eat, you metabolize, you send metabolic energy through networks, they supply the cells, the cells, uh, some of that energy is allocated to what I've already talked about a little bit, repair of uh, damage that is inevitable. 
uh, and then grows new cells, new biomass, and that's how you grow. So part of your, we're in a growing phase, part of your metabolism is allocated to growth. And in fact, when you're you know, a tiny baby, most of it, is, is it goes to growth. And, um, and uh, we have a theory, so you can put that into mathematical terms. And what you discover is you can uh, derive mathematically what's called the growth curve. That is, how does the size of the organ change with age? And what you discover is, uh, it's, it's very lovely, it uh, agrees beautifully with all the data, meaning that you grow quickly at the beginning, and then eventually you stop, and you stay that way till you die, roughly speaking. And it turns out that the reason that you stop growing is because the scaling of metabolic rate, meaning the input of energy to the cells, scales sublinearly, that is less than linearly, with the increase in the number of cells, which is growing linearly. In other words, the system is growing faster than the ability of the metabolic rate going constrained by the networks to supply it. Because one is going with this kind of three quarters, and the other one's going linearly, and linear is bigger than three quarters. Linear is one, going proportional to. And so the linearity always wins. That is, the growth of the system always eventually beats the supply. The demand beats the supply, and the system grinds to a halt. And you can calculate all of that in this theory. And we do it when we're about, you know, less than 20 years old. Um, the mouse does it after about a week, I forget. Uh, but you can calculate all that, and it's lovely and very satisfying. So the, 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 the cessation of growth, the stability of organisms, is intimately related to the economy of scale, the sublinear scale symbolic rate. And it plays an extraordinarily important role in the long-term sustainability of all of life. Because most organisms, not all, but most organisms spend the majority of their lives in a stable state, like we do. Um, and uh, so it plays so that's important now let's go to cities cities the dominant part of a city actually it's people otherwise it wouldn't have cities that's what cities are for cities all the you know you may think of cities of, as that glorious in sydney and all those buildings but you know that's actually secondary to people like you and the citizens that's what it's that, that bridge is the bloody people it's not uh, you know it's not an accident obviously so the people are important and social networks dominate what city is actually and um everything socioeconomic scales super linearly the bigger you are the more per capita so how does this grow they do it in exactly the same way conceptually you have this social metabolic rate that's operating, which is increasing faster than linearly. And what is happening, some of that goes to maintenance of what's in the city, maintaining the buildings and roads and the resource lines, maintaining the people with doctors and hospitals. So that's maintenance. And then there's another piece that goes to growing. It grows the infrastructure and it grows new people. So you can write all that down mathematically and solve the equations and what you find despite the fact that the equation looked just like it did in biology the superlinearity now leads to something that is quite different and not to stable growth which we would consider by the way the paradigm the the um free market capitalist system which has given us all of this of course, uh, growth that stops is considered anathema to that. We have to have open-ended growth. 
And what is very satisfying about this theory is that the superlinear behavior gives rise to open-ended growth. So the theory at this level is very satisfying. It says that we have social networks, and I didn't say this about social networks, that social networks have built into them positive feedback. You know, we, I talk to you, you talk to someone else, they talk to me, and between us, you know, we build on something. That's the very nature of social interaction. Most of what we build on is pointless and useless. <laughs> but of course, every once in a while, out comes, you know, quantum mechanics or uh, the theory of relativity or Google or Microsoft or whatever. So, um, you know, that's the very nature of who we are, that positive feedback. That positive feedback, it turns out, gives rise to the superlinearity. It is the positive feedback mechanisms in social networks that gives rise to the superlinearity. And the superlinearity leads to open-ended growth. So it's a very consistent theory and explains pretty much, you know, the, the sort of coarse-grained big picture of um, what we see. That's great. However, it has built into it this terrible consequence and it has two things built into it. One is, first, I want to go back to life. In biology, the sublinear scaling and the nature of the networks, the economy of scale of the networks, also leads to the slowing down of the pace of life the bigger you are. So elephants' hearts beat much slower than ours. Um, an hour's beach slower than a mouse's, elephants live much longer than a mouse, and so on. So everything gets stretched out in time so that everything slows down according to these laws. Going to cities and socioeconomic behavior, the superlinearity coming from the positive feedback in social networks gives rise not to the slowing down of the pace of life the bigger you are, but exactly the opposite, the speeding up the pace of life. So the bigger the city, the faster the pace of life, which again, um, you can derive mathematically and you compare with data. Life is faster in Sydney than it is in Canberra. I assume Canberra is smaller than Sydney. <laughs> um, and so on. And faster than, and, and it's faster in Canberra than it is in Alice Springs. And so on. And so um, in a systematic way, and uh, the few things that we can actually measure about that agree very well with this. So, um, so that's one problem, is that as you grow, yes, you have this open-ended growth, but things are getting faster. Life is speeding up, the pace of, and we all feel that. I mean, that's something viscerally we very strongly feel. I mean, my God, just a tangential remark. When I think of life 50 or 70 years ago and compare it to today, I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, I mean, uh, just trying to keep up with this bloody email is, you know, is a full time job. You know, and it's kind of nuts. It was wonderful to have, you know, wait for a letter for two weeks, you know, for something to, some, something to be communicated. Life was, you know, anyway. So that's integral to our lives, and that's integral to the, the dynamic of social networks, and from this viewpoint, inevitable. So that's one sort of disturbing consequence. The other is even more disturbing, and that is in these equations built into the open-ended growth is something that we call technically a finite time singularity. And that means mathematically that these curves are growing faster and faster, but that they would reach an infinite size in a finite time, which is nuts. What I mean by that is if you, took, if you just extrapolate the equations, um, that in some finite time, the GDP would be infinite the wages would be infinite, uh, the number of AIDS cases would be infinite, uh, the number of patents would be, it was completely crazy, of course. Yeah. And um, the theory says what happens, that's, that uh, what, what that leads to is collapse, the system collapses, um, which is sort of a, a sophisticated Malthusian kind of picture. And collapse, however, because we, we don't have infinite resources. 
There's all run, there's all these. Yes, you run out. Yes, you don't yeah. have resources to, to support that. That's exactly. You don't have, and, the, and the, so it just turns over and decays. So uh, you can ask yourself, how in the hell do you avoid that? And what you realize is something truly fundamental about our lives and what's happened, especially since the Industrial Revolution. And that is that um, everything I've said just now about cities and open-ended growth is assuming that the way we live, the paradigm under which we're living, the, the dominant paradigm doesn't change. That is, you know, we've discovered coal or we've discovered oil or the, the, that dominates the economy or we've invented computers or we've just invented IT, you know, which sort of dominates um, the way life is becomes structured. Um, so that tells us what it is we have to do to avoid collapse. It says... As this thing goes through open-ended growth, before it reaches the singularity, you better make a paradigm shift. You better make a major innovation. You better make something better change. You better discover computers. <laughs> something. Um, because what that is equivalent to reinventing yourself and starting all over again. So the form of the growth curve is you grow quickly, you would collapse, but somewhere along that, you reset the clock, reinvent yourself, so to speak, over a relatively short period of time, and take off again. And if you look at the data going back quite a long way, that is what has happened. The, the, the data strongly supports that. And um, so you say, great, fantastic. That's exactly what we've done. And of course, that is the mantra of all politicians, of all economists. And that's the wonder of the free market system. It's the best system for doing this. and encourages new ideas, new innovation. And uh, so what, we shouldn't worry. We're always going to innovate ourselves out of it. And I have been in some very high-level meetings where people continue to say that all the time. However, if you have this theory, you believe it, um, this has the following consequence. Yes, it predicts all this, and it predicts it in a systematic way with which the data agrees. However, one of the things it predicts is the time between successive innovations has to get shorter and shorter in a systematic way. In other words, it's not just that the pace of life is increasing, but it's actually accelerating, and it's accelerating such a way that you have to innovate faster and faster. It's not that you have to innovate more and more, but in addition, you have to do it faster and faster. So that if you take this idea, sort of reductio ad absurdum, you would have to eventually have to have the equivalent to an IT revolution, not just every 15, 20 years, which this one took, but every five years, then every year, then every month, and so on. This is not so. Obviously, the system cannot. We can't be even handle the the rate of change at the moment. I mean, our laws no. can't keep up with technology. We're all. I feel exactly. like we're in the car, and the car's going way too fast, and the car's starting to fall apart. But we're going faster and faster and faster, regardless. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so my that's a very good image. My image that I often give is I have two images that I give. One is the treadmill image that we're on a treadmill. And that treadmill is accelerating and it's going faster and faster. And we have to run faster and faster. That's hard enough. But then we have to jump at some stage to another treadmill that's going faster and faster and faster. And you have to make that jump faster and faster and faster. So it's sort of like a double exponential. And of it's course, exhausting. we're going to have a socioeconomic heart attack. Yes. Yeah. The other image I have actually that I like to give is um, of. Um, what is it? Um, uh, ah, pushing the rock up the hill. Sisyphus. Sisyphus, thank you. The Sisyphean image that we're pushing the rock up the hill. The, and of course, you get to the top and it rolls down again and you've got to do it again. That's Sisyphus. Yeah. We have to do that. But Sisyphus had it easy compared to us because Sisyphus, it was the same rock. And it was going at the same rate every time. For us, every time it rolls down, we have to push it up systematically faster. 
the next time even faster, the next time even faster than that. And, and we all have to do it. It's not just some poor bloke that's been condemned by Zeus to do this. It's all of us. And so, um, you know, and, and, I, and, you know, we can ask ourselves, when is the next major innovation going to have to take place? That's going to be very soon, 10, 15 years, I think. We have to do something. There will be maybe it's 20 years, 25 years. Um, uh, we're having to have another major change. And it could be, by the way, and that could take us through to the next level, could be something like driverless cars, which sound pretty mundane, but, you know, might have revolutionary changes to societies. Who in the hell knows? You know, none of this this kind of thinking can predict in any way, obviously, what it is, but it does predict that you can't go on forever. Mm. That something fundamental has to change in order to come to grips with it. That's the speculation that comes out of the more rigorous theory. Do you think we have the global, or do you think we have the political systems in place uh, that will that are equipped to deal with these these global problems and if not what do you think we require because it feels like to me we need a a systematic upgrade a, a, an upgrade from local level thinking to global level thinking and as, as well as that a level of decision making uh, power at that level uh, which is a worrying thing to consider when you think about the rise of nationalism and just the amount of power and um, the the observed combativeness, I guess, of, of, of certain nations? Well, the simple answer to your question, of course, no, we don't. I, we don't even have close to it. And I would say my pessimism about the future is less because of that, uh, that picture, that image that I just described that uh, is an extrapolation from the, the, this, this uh, framework. <clears throat> but more because we don't have the political leadership or political will to be able to make the change. And also because if, I, if you believe what I've been talking about and you trace back where all this comes from, it comes from social interaction and the kind of dynamic of social networks which is our very strength, which has led us to this, and especially coupled with our discovery of free market systems and fossil fuels, uh, and the exploitation of fossil fuels, that has led us to this. Um, but it's also our very undoing, because that social network has led to the speeding up of the pace of life, and the idea that we have to do this faster and faster, and uh, it, and what it means is that we should have been thinking about these questions not now when we only have, let's even put it 50 years to solve these problems. <laughs> I mean, I think that's generous. Um, we should have started 100 years ago or even 50 years ago maybe to address these issues. And uh, so my biggest concern is the combination that we don't have the political will and leadership and we don't have time. Mm. And um, because what it requires, if, I, if one is to believe this, is a revolutionary change, not just, a parad not just a, what has been called in the past a paradigm shift, namely a new innovation, yet another yeah. innovation. That, according to this, does not do it. What you need is to change the underlying dynamic, uh, which is revolutionary, and that requires, you know, something extraordinary because it requires something about the way we interface with each other. And it means that uh, we have to somehow encourage this um, other, this, this kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, this, this part of us, which is also essentially human, um, which is uh, that of altruism of caring for the other, for uh, want of a better word, love, <laughs> love thy neighbor, um, for being concerned about the long-term future of not just your own children or grandchildren, but everybody's, 
and sort of this other side um, as distinct from what has dominated culture, which is greed, not necessarily pejoratively greed, but just wanting more. You know, I'd like to have more. I'd like to see, quote, better in the material sense. You know, I'd like to have a better car, better iPhone, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, more of this. Uh, that has dominated, and it's led to the extraordinary world we live in. It needs to now be not just tempered with, but uh, apparently replaced by, um, not replaced by, but uh, uh, no, that's not right, but to be balanced by this other side. So what we're looking for, uh, what I've realized, this is unlikely to happen bottom up, which I used to think would be the solution. I don't think it has to be top down, unfortunately, meaning that goes to your question about political structures, structures, because what it probably needs is what I've come to term anti-Trump, some of the exact opposite to Trump, but like Trump, that is charismatic, touches some collective nerve, some archetypal collective nerve. But this time, instead of the greed and me, 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 and I don't care about rational thinking or facts and dialogue, but what I do care about is you and, um, um, you know, being together and doing things together, right. social behavior and so forth. So we sort of need, <laughs> I'm ending on a very flaky note, we need sort of a, a Nelson Mandela, a Jesus Christ, uh, a Mahatma Gandhi. But, you know, you need one of these people that uh, somehow, um, which is what Trump did in this country, um, was somehow touch something that is in all of us. I mean, I have obviously peace parts of Trump are inside me. I want more of various things, and I get we're fed up sometimes. The same. I'm what? Well, we're 90% the same as Trump. I mean, we're all scaled versions of each other, so. Yes, well, we are, Sorry. but it's that, you know, but this is now at this 15% level, I'm afraid, not the 85%. Yeah. So anyway, no, so the idea is to be a bit more serious that, you know, we need something fundamentally structurally changed in social dynamics. Mm. Um, which I had thought was impossible. This is my point, really, is that I thought when I started thinking along these lines was not that it was impossible, but it would take so long, there wasn't time. Mm. And Mr. Doe, that you could change social, what appeared to be social struct, social thinking in one year. That is, you know, the kinds of things that um, are being tolerated um, now um, are things that even two years ago, certainly 20 years ago, would have been totally unthinkable. That is, you know, we do think of ourselves as being people who want to have discourse and dialogue and base our ideas on facts and rational thought and so on. And that has sort of, roughly speaking, been thrown out of the window. And that translated into uh, weird ideas about what patriotism is supposed to be and, uh, and so forth, and me, me, me. And, and uh, you know, it's not getting rid of all that, frankly. I mean, I'm, that's an integral part of who we are. But it does need to be tempered with this other side, this more <clears throat> the love neighbor side. Yeah. But I've no, you know, that's just the yeah. off, off, oh, oh, so, I mean, I know this is on the record kind of thing, but off the record, it's total speculation. Of course, of course.